I had built my house and closed it up enough to make a good winter storage for my belongings, but without a wood stove or insulation, it didn't seem like a very pleasant place to live over the winter. So I made other arrangements and began cleaning up and preparing my plot for my absence. After removing most of my stuff into the new house, I made sure that my peeled logs were properly stored as well, using the tractor to move them up onto blocks so they would remain dry and I wouldn't lose all that hard work I put into peeling them. I was thankful to have use of the tractor, as I certainly couldn't have done this on my own. The last rainstorm had shown me that I was funneling lots of water onto my property via the new access road. Unfortunately, it was also directing that water right towards my new house. So before I left, I had to finish the lower part of the road, which would direct the water towards the plateau area of my plot. I roughed it in with the excavator, and then used a back blade attachment for the tractor to smooth it out and carve a slight grade towards the uphill side. Much like a swale, but not exactly on contour. Next year, I can work on directing this water where it is needed, but for now, it can soak in right here. I packed up my truck and took one last look around my plot, which is now looking a lot different from the way it looked last summer when I arrived. I wondered how it might change over the time I'd be gone, and then set out on my next adventure. My family offered to help me fly back to Southern California for Thanksgiving, and I was excited to see them again. But first, it was back to Mike Aether's place, along with Evan and Sharla. Mike had agreed to let me stay the winter in exchange for help on his land. Evan and Sharla were considering the offer as well, and so we spent the next few days before my flight getting things ready for winter. The main task was loading the truck up with lots of firewood to deliver up to the ridge house. Most of my work this winter will be done in the rich house, doing lots of finished carpentry and getting this beautiful house ready to live in. We got a good chunk of the wood split and stacked next to the wood stove, ready to keep me warm. We took turns with the splitting mall, and I must admit I'm out of practice, but I'm sure I will have lots of time to perfect my technique over the winter, and I'm looking forward to spending lots of time sitting in front of the fire. The day of my flight had come. And so we said goodbye to Mike and his menagerie of animals. We were escorted off the property by two billy goats and then headed down the road to the airport. I stared out of the window as we drove, admiring the beauty of the patterns of nature as they blended with the patterns of man. As my plane descended into Los Angeles, I gazed out the window at some very different patterns. From the air, LA looks like a massive circuit board, a perfect grid. Each square zigzagged with a maze of black tar, green lawns, and identical tract home roofs, or concrete industrial buildings and big box shopping centers, like transistors and processors plugged into the silicon board substrate of parking lots. And though it looks impressive, I know the city is fragile. Everything this machine depends upon to operate is shipped in from somewhere else, bleeding out into the city on the backs of trucks. Even the water itself, the basic ingredient for life, is pumped in from half a state away and all of it is utterly dependent upon a steady yet dwindling supply of oil. To me, Los Angeles represents the failure of modern civilization, a city so far removed from its environment, so out of touch with the patterns of nature, that it constantly teeters on the edge of disaster. Nothing demonstrates this better than the Los Angeles River, once a thriving ecosystem, now just a concrete channel with the sole purpose of moving any rain that does so happen to bless this desert, quickly out to sea where it can cause no more so-called problems. But there is hope. The drought of the last decade has pushed more people to become aware of the environment in which they live. Green lawns are turning brown and being replaced with more appropriate landscaping. All around, people are following the example of those who have always known that Los Angeles is as much a desert as Phoenix or Las Vegas. A jacaranda has become the city's go-to street tree replacing the towering ponderosas that take on a much different form than their cousins in Montana. And there is even food to be found on the streets of LA, like these loquat trees, also known as the Japanese plum, which is one of my favorite fruits from this area. Of course, there's lots of citrus, oranges, and lemons. There are also some foods that require less water, like this prickly pear cactus, or this giant pataya in my friend's front yard. I even found some edible greens growing in front of a restaurant. Still, there was a long way to go in encouraging people to work with nature. For example, countless tons of organic matter are still being shipped off to the landfill each day. Thankfully, there are a few people making use of these wasted resources 
in order to grow food for their community. While in LA, I visited Rishi Kumar of Sarvodaya Farms. Please check out my next video to see how Rishi and his family have turned this half acre dirt lot into a thriving garden producing fresh quality food for their CSA. After my time in LA, I made my way down to the suburban sprawl of Orange County, where I lived for most of my life and where I still must go to visit my family. Returning is always bittersweet, as Orange County represents an exaggeration of the environmental amnesia and rampant inequality present in Los Angeles. Yet, my love for my family and the calming presence of the ocean still caused me to consider this place as home. For most of my life here, I would often find escape in nature by surfing, mountain biking, or by helping to create bike parks like this one in the pockets of wilderness left between the developments. This is the most recent creation, and it was here that I first realized I could blend the principles of permaculture with my lifelong passion, and began formulating the concept of the permaculture bike park. Near the end of my time in California, I took the train back up to Los Angeles to visit my friend Travis and read another creation tucked into a pocket of greenery amongst the concrete jungle. This place was incredibly fun, and resembles much of what I envisioned for the permaculture bike park. A quiet, secluded escape from the noise of the city, where people can gather to celebrate and enjoy their passion for bicycles, under the shade of a closed canopy and surrounded by an environment that supports the health and joy of all nature's creatures. This next year at the Ant Village, I plan to start bringing this vision to life, building the first true permaculture bike park, a prototype to test my methods and experiment alongside nature, so that maybe I can go on to build these parks in cities and suburbs and provide an exciting place for people to connect with the environment on which they depend.